Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. Today, I'm in conversation with Shailaja Venkata Subramanian, who is an Associate Professor Emeritus at the School of Information Systems and Technology at San Jose State University. She is also a Fellow of the Salzburg Global Seminar and a Master Teacher Award recipient. A special note on this episode. During this conversation, Shailaja talks about some very personal moments in her life that some might find disturbing or moving. Having said that, in this conversation, she talks about how she wanted to do science, but was influenced to take up commerce, and later on, encouraged by her mother, went on to study accounting in the USA, and grabbing the first opportunity to get into information systems and computer science, and later on, encouraged by her professor, also getting to do a PhD in information science. How she was able to overcome her initial fears when she was part of a group where everybody else had an engineering background. Her career as a teacher and then in a startup and when she had to balance her personal and professional priorities, switching back to academics. She also talks about a couple of phases where she had to go through a lot of challenges personally with some family health challenges to be addressed, as well as some uneasy situations at work and how all these experiences made her more patient. Yeah, This and more in this conversation. Listen on. Hi, okay. Shalija. Welcome to the Software People Stories. Thank you, Shiv. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so glad to be here. And uh, t just to say a little bit about my background, I was born and raised in Bombay slash Mumbai. At least it was Bombay when I was there. I went to school there. Uh, when I finished 10th standard, um, I assumed I was going to take science because everyone in my family did that and I had the percentage to get in. But one of my brothers decided it wasn't a good idea mm -hmm. and to take commerce and I still hold that against him. And uh, so I did do commerce, but my heart was never in it. It's like I did study economics, I studied accounting, I did all those things, but it wasn't interesting for me uh, because I had a little bit of experience with programming when I was in 10th standard and I found that to be very exciting. So in any case, um, I went through BCom and the logical next thing seemed like to do the CA and started doing my CA. And uh, again, I was doing my internship, what do they call it, in articleship, articleship with Pricewaterhouse, working tons of hours, getting paid very little, studying for exams. It wasn't a pleasant experience, especially since my heart really wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. But at some point in time, thanks to my mother, actually, it was my mom's idea that I should come to the US to study. So I applied to schools here and I got into a master's program at Virginia Tech. And my choices were very limited at that point because uh, most US universities require four four year bachelor's degrees and BCom is a three years bachelor's degree. So I was pretty much like uh, restricted to only those colleges that were willing to look at that. So anyway, so I went to Virginia Tech uh, and very, very fortunately for me, um, I ran into a professor there who, who was actually not an accounting professor, even though he was in that department, he taught information systems classes. Okay. It turned out that there was an information systems um, emphasis that you could follow if you wanted to. And so, of course, I jumped on that bandwagon right away, took every every single information systems class that the department was offering. And then I took some in computer science as well. And still, I didn't know what I was going to be doing with all this. I knew I had to finally mm -hmm. get a job and I assumed that it would be something related to accounting. But then all of a sudden, the professor who I would met initially, he said, have you thought about doing a PhD? And I was like, me, PhD in what? And he said, information systems. 
And I said, but I don't have a background. I've just taken a few classes over here. My mm. bachelor's degree has nothing to do with information systems. And he said, doesn't matter. So the, the fact that he showed confidence in me, that was very, very huge. If, if it weren't for that, I wouldn't have ventured into this. Mm. So in any case, he helped me pick universities to apply to. Got into the University of Arizona. And I was there for five years. Got a PhD in management information systems. And I would say that I was really, really happy doing that. Mm. Because I was finally doing what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I was learning what I wanted to do. And the thing was, it wasn't easy. Because when I arrived in the PhD program, I found that um, there were many other Indian students and they were all like engineering students from IITs mm. and otherwise. And for a minute, I was like, oh my God, where have I landed up? Because I don't mm -hmm. have the background these guys have. Because mm. I don't have the math background, I don't have the programming background. So it, it, so initially it was a little bit um, scary. I'm not just got over that, but I took especially data structures and so on. It, I just found it so interesting. Mm. So it, it was easy to get over that initial fear as well. And finally got my PhD. And that program in particular, they uh, kind of almost train you to go into academia. Okay. So I, at least at that point, I didn't know a single person who had gone into industry after mm -hmm. that PhD. So I applied to jobs in universities and I got uh, four jobs and I took the one that I got at Tulane University. So my fiance at that time, he was working for IBM's research lab in San Jose, um, got married that year as well. And at that point, we decided that California is probably the best place for both of us. Uh, it, it just happened that a headhunter for a knowledge management startup got in touch with me to ask me if I had any students. And so I got a job with a startup in Cupertino here in the Valley. But because I'd been at Tulane for just a year, they asked me if I could teach for one more semester. And I said, well, I also have this job. Hmm. And they said, can you come over week, one weekend a month? Okay. And so I was actually teach, working crazy, crazy hours at a startup, which is a really mm -hmm. taxing startup. And then uh, once a month on Friday morning, I would leave, fly to New Orleans, hmm. teach all of Sunday, all of Sunday, fly back. The next morning go to work here literally diagonal cross country oh yes absolutely yeah. and not just that i could do it only because i was younger i had the energy and more importantly i had no kids mm. so but again those three years of the startup i thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. it i did not mind the fact that i was my life was practically just that startup i wasn't doing anything else mm. but it was it felt very very fulfilling the startup went nowhere but uh, I've got a lot of really good experience and met a lot of great people, learned a lot of stuff. Hmm. Um, and then at some point when we decided, okay, it's time to start a family. And I knew this startup kind of lifestyle is not going to work. And so I had to again take a step back and see, okay, what do I do now? So hmm. then the closest university that is, was, was, that's here to our, wherever we live is San Jose State University. Okay. So I sent an email. I sent an email to the chair saying, I'm looking for a job, so do you have any openings? Mm. And he replied, like, yeah, we have openings, you want to talk? Oh, and nice. I said, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, uh, and he said, okay, where are you? I said, I'm in Cupertino. He said, okay, let's meet at the Starbucks. Mm. So we met at Starbucks, which is very strange because my previous university interviews were all very, very formal and mm -hmm. you know, two day interviews, presentations and whatnot. And here I'm meeting this guy at a Starbucks and discussing <laughs> mm -hmm. the job. Yeah. But eventually, of course, I did have to go in and interview in front of everybody else, but mm -hmm. it felt very different. Mm -hmm. And I got the job and it was a tenure track position, which meant, of course, that I had to, for seven, eight years, I had to really slog it out, mm -hmm. publish, and then also uh, have good teaching record, serve on committees and so on. But also my biological clock was ticking. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to have children. So, um, I joined in 2003, my son was born in 2004, my daughter was born in 2007, and then I got tenure in 2010. Oh. So those, those again were crazy years. And just to show you how crazy it was, uh, there was one um, evening, this was before my daughter was born, my son, son was still little, and he was not well. And I started cooking, I put some oil in the stove, I had my laptop open on the kitchen counter preparing for the next day's uh, lecture. Then I heard my son cry, went to him. Then I totally forgot about the kitchen. Ooh. And when I came back to the kitchen, the kitchen was on fire. Uh, 
the microwave about it about it had melted down it was out of control uh -huh. so i had to call the fire department uh -huh. and get them to come and get it off so we had to redo the whole kitchen uh -huh. but uh, that also i think that was a good lesson for me because i realized that i was very very overwhelmed there's uh -huh. too much on at the same time any case uh, that taught me one lesson that i need to focus on just one thing at a time whatever it is uh -huh. And then up to 2000, end of 2012, I really enjoyed the tenure part and I was researching whatever I felt like researching, getting into projects that I really liked and was really interested in. Then in the beginning of 2013, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, that time, my mom and dad were both in India. So that year, the year 2013, um, I was actually going back home every two months. First, I went back for a week. That was my spring break. I combined it with one more week and then had someone teach in my place. Then the summer again, I went back to India. And uh, that was when it really went into stage four. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there for six weeks at that time, I think six or seven weeks, but I had I'd left my son here. Mm -hmm. And my husband was here. Mm -hmm. So it was like literally being, like felt like being torn between two. Things. And really having a mom asking me to be with her during chemo and me saying no that was very 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 hard mm. so and that time my kids were in school so first grade and uh, fourth grade was it yeah first and fourth grade mm. and so i made arrangements over here with nanny cook this that everything and went to india in september but uh, within like two three weeks of me getting there amma passed away mm. so wrapped up all that came back and then uh, 2014 came along and Appa moved in with me and uh, which was which was nice. It was nice to have him here. He was very close to the children. They learned a lot from him. And um, unfortunately, though, his, he had been diagnosed with prostate cancer when he was, uh, it was even before Aman was diagnosed with cancer. And so when he finally came to the US and we checked him, it turned out that his was in stage three. Mm -hmm. The doctors here, here said, it's controllable as long as he undergoes radiation and but it's 45 sessions of radiation mm -hmm. so basically nine weeks five days a week mm -hmm. now the problem was here my husband had started doing a startup he founded his own startup mm -hmm. kids are super, super busy i still had a job i was teaching mm -hmm. i'm doing supposedly doing research at that point everything was going to the dogs at that point and uh, and then this radiation thing comes along mm -hmm. and um, and I had to, of course, take my dad for radiation. I, there was no one else to do it, right? Hmm. So um, all that actually was stressful, but I was still carrying through it until the chair of my department, I don't even know if a, I should talk about this because it involves other people. The chair of my department was cheating on his wife and having an affair with one of my coworkers. Hmm. And she, she wanted some course arrangements to be changed. And so he wanted to change my courses as a result of it. So when I heard about it, I, and I thought I was pretty senior by that time. I had done a lot of research projects with him. We had published papers together. Courses, I went and told him, hey, this is a really bad time. My dad's not well. Don't change my courses, right? Mm. I don't have the time to prep for me. At that point, it, it, it was bizarre. I couldn't understand why he was being so adamant. Because there were so many other faculty members who would have gladly taught the class and go to the dean mm -hmm. but that didn't work out well because the dean then went back to him and told him hey she's came and complained to me about this he didn't take it well so the whole thing became one big huge mess in the midst of all this there was a lot of harassment essentially because when i when the chairperson of a department wants to harass you they can find tons of ways to mm -hmm. harass you because they control funds they control whether you get paid to go to a conference they have control over your schedule which is a huge thing right so there was a lot of harassment and so i don't know what to do so i went back to the dean and i said hey look there is a problem here i can't work like this mm -hmm. and, I, and in the midst of all this i'm apart my dad doesn't even know that all i was having all this going on at work mm -hmm. because i can't go tell him i'm having problems at work so anyways so um yeah because by then his dementia was pretty bad too and mm -hmm. so he would forget why he was getting radiation. Mm -hmm. So every morning he would get up and say, why are we doing this radiation? I'd be like, you have cancer. And he would be like, but the doctor in India said, I don't have cancer. And I'd be like, no, no, that's true. But here now it's stage three, we have to do it. And this question every single day. Mm -hmm. So that was also pretty, I mean, even though it's, that's just a mental thing, it's still exhausting. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So anyway, so uh, I went to the date and <laughs> tell him like, hey, look, I have a lot going on in my life. I don't want people messing with me right now. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I was, uh, I don't know, I don't mean to brag, but I had got awards for teaching and so mm-hmm. on. Very popular. My classes were always overfilled. They were waiting lists. So I thought I'd proven myself to a point where I could ask for these accommodations. Mm-hmm. And uh, the dean, who was this old white guy, he uh, asked me at, at this point, how old are you? Mm-hmm. I was like, I was very taken aback. I said, right. I'm 46. And he says, well, when my first wife, she underwent menopause, she, she used to get very angry and take it out on everybody else. Mm. And then I had to divorce her. And then my current wife, she's going through menopause. I mm. deserve to get two medals for this. And I'm looking at him thinking, why he's telling me all this? Mm. And he tells me, you know, I said, I said, are you saying that I'm going through menopause and that's why I'm having? He said, mm. yes. Mm. I was shocked mm-hmm. beyond because I'd only heard of such things happening and never thought it actually happens, this mm. kind of discombination. Mm. Mm. Because actually I've heard my chair talk about other women in the past mm. where he would say, oh, she's being hormonal. Mm. So I, I, I knew that kind of culture existed, but I didn't know it ex- existed to this extent. Mm. So then I took it up to the higher levels and I complained about it. That uh, Dean eventually left but I was still continuing. And at this point, I was quite tired of fighting the system because I'd mm-hmm. gone all the way up to the president of the university. Mm-hmm. And I knew that it's, stat- it's very difficult to change status quo. Mm-hmm. I could have gotten a lawyer. I could have fought it. But I chose not to do it because my, home, uh, my focus was my father. And my husband had absolutely no time for the children. So mm-hmm. the children are all mine. And so at that point, I decided I'm not going to fight it. I'll just endure it. Uh, but then I found out that if you retire at age 50, you still get to keep your health benefits for yourself and your family. Okay. So I made that my goal. I said, okay, I'll retire when I'm 50. Mm-hmm. So I stuck it out until I turned 50 in 2019, and then I quit. Mm-hmm. And I think that was actually a pretty good decision because I found that I had so much more time for my children. I was so much more patient with Upper. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't like I was suppressing my irritation anymore i was actually being mm-hmm. patient with them and being able to hear the same things multiple times and not worry about whether i have to prepare for a lecture or write mm-hmm. a paper or anything so anyways so that uh, was 2019 and the beginning of 2022 when was when upper's cancer then went into stage four mm-hmm. and um, but then at that point i uh, i'd been approached by this place called coder school asking if i could manage one of their locations and i, I was actually itching to do something by that mm-hmm. point so I said, okay, I'll do it. And I took it on. Um, well, I did set it up, honestly, from mm. scratch. Mm. And unfortunately, by the time it was June, uh, Appa had to be hospitalized. Mm. And this time when he came out, he was in really bad shape. And again, it came to a point, like, you know, I knew I had very little time left with Appa. Um, the, the coder school was taking up a lot of time. And every time I would leave the house, Appa would say, where are you going? Where are you going? Why are you leaving? Mm. And then, you know, I, again, I took a decision which may not have been the most uh, wisest of decisions, but I still took it. I said, you know what, I'll quit it mm. because I have very little time left with Tapa. We don't need the money. I'm not going to, uh, later on, I don't want to regret saying mm. that I didn't give up my time. So July onwards, July, August, September, October, those four months, I completely actually focused on Appa. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so November comes along. November, he is um, very, very sick. And November 5th, he passes away. I did look back on the past 10 years, which was very, very uh, up and down mm-hmm. because I had the San Jose State job, then the quarter school job. and mm-hmm. But honestly, at the end of the day, I'm glad I did what I did which is a big thing to say because I have colleagues who are within the PhD program with me, one of whom has just become the Dean of a school. Okay. And I look at that and I hear about that. I'm going like, oh, mm-hmm. I didn't do anything. But the thing is that I feel, still I feel it's the right thing to do. Mm. So I, have a, I have a sense of satisfaction. So at this point, um, honestly, I'm on, I am on a loose end. I'm taking like Udemy classes on chat GPT. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, teaching some kids to, program in Python. These are friends, kids who want to just come and learn how to program. So I'm teaching them how to program. 
Mm. Uh, still wondering what to do. Essentially, I know I want to do something, but kind of fi figuring things out at this point because my my daughter is also in eleventh grade, mm. so eleventh are pretty crucial for her for getting into college so i can't go into some full-time corporate job that would not work mm. i do want to start forming ideas about what i want to do and then also you know how it is in the technical field right you have to keep retraining yourself all the time because things change so to some extent teaching these kids to program is also forcing me to keep myself up to date so that's where i am thanks Ali. i mean i could get to one probably common theme that has been running is uh, all these years uh, it's been about you know, helping others whether it is students or parents or children and others now I know that in general one needs me time and this could be stressful because we don't really have things under control but then it also requires a lot of patience mm -hmm. so when it comes to even switching from accounting or a commerce background into, as you said, with other engineers who are probably your fellow students and working in the departments and all that. How were you able to find your niche of being different or identifying something so that it is not a direct competition, mm -hmm. whether it is in choosing the topics or when you say uh, research in MIS, you know, those days it used to be just talking about information systems and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, not probably considered as deep as some of the techies would do, saying no, yeah. coding is what it is all about. Because mm -hmm. later on, the realization that everyone got into was that if you want to design some large solutions, you have to think about design. And I like particularly when you said data structures. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's something that most developers today are not even aware of. Mm. They just want to know a syntax and then write something. And then let's mm. see, like you said, ask chat GPT to write some code. Yeah. <laughs> so when you want to uh, you know, think at that level of depth at the same time, balance all these other dynamics around you, you know, how was that? Um, so going back to my first semester in the PhD program, that's when I had this realization of what I've landed myself into um, because I saw the background of the others, especially statistics, the, the statistics was very strong. Math was very strong. Coding was very strong. So, and it did mean that I had to do a lot of extra work. So if I took a class in say operations research, I had to go back and learn some math hmm. in order to be able to deal with that class. If I took an advanced statistics class, which they put us in advanced classes right away, Mm -hmm. I had to go back and learn some basic statistics. So um, it meant a lot of hard work initially. Mm -hmm. Initially, it meant the catching up took time. Mm -hmm. But then I also realized at some point that doing a PhD is not just about technical skills, but it's also, also about ideas mm -hmm. and how you come up with solutions and so on. And thankfully for me, um, it just turned out that... Uh, a project came along which was related to remote sensing and satellite data okay. and um, using that to come up with answers to questions and so on and honestly none of the other people had any any experience with satellite data uh -huh. and so which meant that i just went off to the remote sensing uh, department took classes on satellite data production interpretation um, i took some gis classes and by that point, I realized it didn't matter whether what my colleagues knew and or my, what my peers knew and what I knew, mm -hmm. because if I was going to attack a particular problem, I'm just going to go off there and just learn whatever I had to learn in the process mm -hmm. and not worry about whether they already knew it or not. Mm -hmm. So I think the only difference it made was that I think the only Bs I got, a couple of Bs were in my first semester, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is doesn't matter at all in the larger scheme of things, especially in a PhD program. Um, after that, it just meant I was actually just focused on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I, the thing was, I really, really enjoyed um, database management. So mm -hmm. I taught myself SQL very well. And then I took the remote sensing classes, the GIS classes. And then after that, my research was completely in that field. It wasn't even connected to what the others were doing. So, mm -hmm. and, um, and then by, but the, the program was also very good. I have to say that because they actually had 
uh, seminars in which we read papers and um, critiqued papers and understood mm -hmm. how papers are written and how you evaluate them. And so getting a really good understanding of what good research involves. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, my coding skills are still not as strong as their coding skills. Math skills, nowhere close. But the thing is, I think over my career, I've done things which didn't require me to, mm. to do any of that stuff. So multiple questions. Mm. Now, now, first is whether it is you know, teaching college students or kids. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you would go and then learn a new topic when you got mm -hmm. in there. How do you instill that, say, maybe earning for learning in them? Particularly that, when it is a topic which is supposed to be very technical, analytical, and then no emotions there, etc. That is right. the first one. Second is, what is the difference that you've seen, either in terms of the expectations or your own style, when it comes to you know, teaching adults and teaching children? I had a question on how, as a teacher, she instills the yearning for learning among her students, whether they were young adults or children, and what variations she sees in her own styles of teaching. The answer to that question and a lot more in the next part of this episode. Don't miss it. We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people's stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.